Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. I'm Georgina and this is Art History Girl. Today we're looking at The Ambassadors, which is a painting by Hans Holbein the Younger and it's in the National Gallery in London. Let's first address the elephant in the room. The most famous symbol in this work is the distorted skull which is placed in the bottom centre of the composition. The skull is shown as an anamorphic, distorted image and it's meant to be a visual puzzle so that the viewer must look at the painting from either high on the right side or low on the left side to see the skull in accurate proportion. It's unclear why Holbein gave it such prominence in this painting as typically skulls in paintings are meant to represent um, vanitas or memento mori, which is the inevitability of death. So next maybe obvious question is who are the figures in the painting? Opinions about who these two men were really differed when this painting was first acquired by the National Gallery. In 1890, Sidney Colvin was the first person to suggest the figure on the left as Jean de Dantfield, the French ambassador to the court of Henry VIII at the time. This was seemingly confirmed when the picture was cleaned and it was revealed that his seat of Polensee is one of the four French places marked on the globe of the painting and Jean was the Lord of Polensee. So it's thought he visited London five times in total. When this would have been painted, it would have been his second visit. And he's pretty reluctant to be in England. He wrote a lot of letters so we know how he felt about his tour of duty, but he never actually mentions Holbein. He lodged in Bridewell Palace and he was ill for most of the time with something that sounded a lot like malaria. In this painting, Jean is making a big impression through his fashionable pink and black clothes. He's presenting himself like a peacock, but he's also showing off the textures and the wealth of the fabrics he's wearing. It's lynx fur and satin sleeves, which would have been very expensive. And there are lots of little details. The slashing is held together with these three pins and there's a gold dagger with an etching. And this shows us his age, actually. It shows he's in his 29th year. So some people interpret that as him being 29. Some people say it's the 29th year, so that makes him 28. And there's a tassel attached to the dagger. Now, this would have been made by putting gold leaf on top of glue and then brushing it away. So it's very delicate and it's absolutely amazing craftsmanship from Holbein. We know from the signature that this double portrait was painted in 1533. And this was an extremely momentous year for the English royal family. This was the year Henry VIII divorced Catherine of Aragon and married Anne Boleyn, and their daughter Elizabeth was born. And she, as many people know, she went on to become the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I, who ruled for 45 years. Anyway, Jean de Dantfield would have been expected to stay for the marriage and the coronation in June, and then the birth of the baby in September because the French king, Francis I, was going to be the godfather. And from his letters, it would seem that John had spent a lot of money for all these ceremonies, and he moaned a lot about the weather. He said, I am and have been very weary and wearisome, he wrote to his family. I am the most melancholy, weary and wearisome ambassador in the world. So we get it, he was a bit of a moaner. But the fact that he's been given the job of ambassador shows he's an established figure of France's court and he's been trusted to carry messages between the English and French courts. So it's a position of a lot of responsibility. It could be possible that Henry VIII saw this painting by Holbein and wanted to be shown similarly to John de Dunkfield. Holbein's portrait of Henry VIII was painted in 1536 to 37, but it was destroyed by a fire in 1698. However, it is still well known through many copies and it's one of the most iconic images of the king. The puffed sleeves and the stance in this picture also bear a striking resemblance to John's portrait. And then there was the publication of Mary Harvey's book, which was written in 1900, and that formally identified the man on the right. She decided he was Georges de Sauve, who was the Bishop of Lavaux, and she found this out by tracing down a 17th century manuscript which mentions the painting. Georges de Sauve is not wearing religious robes because it's thought he wasn't consecrated until 1534, so that's the year after, and that's actually because he was too young at the time. He'd been a bishop since he was 18, 
and the book he's leaning on says he's in his 25th year, so again he's either 25 or 24. Instead of the bishop's robes, he's wearing a browny purple damask, which to our eye looks fairly plain, but those dark colours would have taken a lot of dye and been really expensive as well. So in two of Jean de Dampfield's letters to his brother, he mentions George de Selve visiting London in the spring of 1533. On the 23rd of May, he wrote, Monsieur de Laveur did me the honour of coming to see me, which was no small pleasure to me. And many art historians have speculated that Georges de Selve was in London on a secret mission, but there's no evidence to corroborate the theory. On June the 4th, John de Dampfield wrote to his brother again, saying, Monsieur de Laveur came to see me again, but has gone away again. And it was not known exactly how long Georges was in London for, but it could have only been for a few months. Georges was very concerned by the division between the Protestant Lutherans and the Catholic Church, which was ongoing in Europe. And he was also quite concerned about Henry VIII's break from Rome, which happened the year after. The king had recently divorced his wife, which was something that was not allowed in the Catholic doctrine, so he created his own denomination of Christianity, the Church of England. This is the closest we have for a meaning for this painting. All the mysterious objects around the painting are based on this unsettled, unhappy relationship between the Lutherans and the Catholic Church. There's no exact way of knowing how long Holbein had to make this painting. As I said before, it's likely Georges de Selve was only in London for a couple of months and Holbein also managed to create quite a few other works in 1533. He usually made drawings of his sitters, but often you can match up the drawings and the paintings. In the ambassadors, though, no preparatory sketches have survived, and he's possibly made Georges de Serve's face less animated than usual, so that perhaps hints that there wasn't much time for lots of sittings. There seem to be a few shortcuts in the painting as well. He's made the carpet with a big, thick brush, which would have taken a lot less time to paint, and underneath the carpet, there's a dark grey colour, which is actually the base layer of the painting. So it's not actually paint we're seeing there at all. And with the green curtain in the background, Holbein also seems to have laid out the pattern and then introduced the folds over the top. So that would have been another time-saving exercise. So the identification of the figures as Jean de Dantfield and Georges de Selve has remained one of the most accepted by lots of art historians, Although John North, who's also an art historian, says rival speculation has not stopped and is not entirely dead. One art historian, for example, thinks that the man on the right is not Georges de Selve, but Jean's brother Francois, the Bishop of Azur, because he was a well-known patron of the arts with a known interest in mathematical instruments. The earliest manuscript of the painting actually confirms this, although this was an inventory of the Chateau de Polency, their castle. And North says, this was a natural enough supposition to be made by a person with limited local knowledge, since the two brothers lived on the family estates together at the end of their lives, but this is almost certainly mistaken. He points to a letter Françoise wrote Jean in 1533, where he talks about meeting the Pope quite soon and makes no mention of visiting London. Unlike the man on the right of the picture, Françoise was older than Jean de Dantfield, and as we know, the man in the painting is only 24 or 25. Holbein the Younger was a German-born artist who spent much of his time in England, but he was also influenced by the early Netherlandish painters who used symbols to show meaning. The objects in the ambassadors are split in two. On the top shelf, everything represents the heavenly, celestial world, and on the bottom shelf, all the objects represent the terrestrial world, or life on earth. And the two men are linked to the heavenly and the earthly realms as they stand between the two-tiered structure. Although it possibly looks like a quiet set of objects, Holbein has arranged the instruments so that the measurements shown on all the various scales are out of whack. And this is meant to show the chaos in the heavens, which is probably a reference again to the conflict in the church at the time. On the bottom shelf, the terrestrial globe mirrors the celestial one above it, and the words Baris and Britannia. Now, these are Holbein's own phonetic spellings of Paris and Brittany. So it either means his French was really poor, or he's again mixing up 
B's and P's to show disorder. A ruler is lying on top of a page of equations and that begins with the word dividert, which means let division be made, which is another reference to the religious schism tearing Europe apart. Another very literal piece of symbolism is the lute with a broken string, and this was a well-established symbol of ecclesiastical discord. There's also a Lutheran hymn book with the open pages showing a song about the Ten Commandments, and one on the opposite page about the Holy Spirit. And this was obviously a deliberate choice because in the real version of the hymn book, those two hymns were not next to each other, so it suggests a tension between scholars and the clergy. The floor pattern is based on the sanctuary in Westminster Abbey, which was originally inscribed with the phrase, this spherical ball shows the macrocosm archetype. And this was a popular Renaissance philosophy that suggested the forces that rule the human body also shape the entire universe. So this reference to Westminster Abbey's floor shows that the universe is huge and humanity is contrastingly a very small piece within it. Now back to that distorted skull. Why was it there? One possibility is that this painting represents three levels, the heavens and the earth, as shown by the two shelves, and then death adds a third dimension. It's also been hypothesised that the painting is meant to hang in a stairwell, so that someone walking up the stairs would be startled by the skull. Another possibility is that Holbein simply wanted to show off this technique to secure future commissions. Artists often incorporated skulls as a reminder of mortality, and Holbein might have intended the skulls and the crucifix in the upper left corner to encourage contemplation of death and the resurrection. So that's my full analysis. I could definitely go on more about all the scientific instruments, but I hope you've enjoyed that video. I personally think Holbein was an absolute genius. So few people can bring history to life like he did. His paintings are so realistic, they're sometimes photographic. I've actually got um, a sketch that I got given by my parents in my bedroom at home. And yes, it's a pr obviously a print of a sketch, it's not an original. So yes, thank you very much. I really hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you next time.